We're going to get started this morning. Uh, we are picking off where Sky left off last week. And again, I, I cannot say enough how grateful I am that I'm blessed enough to know that when we step aside for a moment to be gone with family or whatever, that I can trust that the pulpit is going to have godly, solid theology being preached from it. And we're going to have great leaders leading worship in the stead. And so we are thankful, thankful for that. But let's go ahead and go to verse 18 of Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up in the last verse 2 of where Brother Scott left off last week. It says, Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So this is, the, he, he's quoting the prophet Joel and what he is saying about the day of Pentecost on when he's pouring out the spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the lord comes the great and magnificent day and verse 21 is where we're really kind of focusing on and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved so i'll be saved. what i love about this this prophecy is that when we look at it 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, it was brought into fulfillment. The prophet Joel had prophesied, and God fulfilled that prophecy on Pentecost Sunday. What's powerful about it, though, is he is still fulfilling it today. There is nothing that the Church of Acts, nothing that Peter or James or John or Matthew or any of them or Paul did from that day on that is not accessible and empowered for us to do today. It's, it's, it's impossible. We have the same call, the same purpose, the same spirit. It is still being fulfilled throughout the world through the church of God today. It's a prophecy that keeps on keeping on. But in this, he spoke what is the most powerful. Because I think sometimes we get caught up in the glam of godly miracles, don't we? Like, God, you, you made the sun stay in the sky for a whole day and it didn't move. You made the earth open up and swallow the evil, and, and then it re-came together. You sent fire from heaven and it enveloped the altar and the meat and the water. You, you sent a, a pillar of smoke and fire, and you split the seas. And, and we, we look at all these large things, and even here, we see the blood and the fire and the vapor and smoke and, and all these things. But we get cut, cut off, and we miss to what I believe is the most powerful part of this entire prophetic word. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a powerful promise. It's a powerful prophetic truth. And when I read that this week and I was studying and preparing, God reminded me of, of another moment in, in history, another story in the Old Testament of another prophet who God had spoken the same kind of truth to, but it didn't turn out quite the same. Because the response was different. And it made me think of Jonah. When God had called on Jonah, and he said, Jonah, go to Nineveh and speak the word that I will give you. And what did Jonah or do? He said, good idea, but I'm not feeling it. I'm going to Tarshish. I heard Nineveh, but what you meant was Tarshish. So he went and fled the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the purpose of God. He went to Tarshish, jumped on a ship, and we know the story from there, that as he's going, he's got a good thing happening. He's on the ride of his life. He's enjoying the moment until God got a hold of the moment. Has ever anybody ever been like on a ride of life that you enjoyed for a moment until God got a hold of the moment? You ever done that? It's like they say sin is fun for a moment. Until God gets a hold of the moment. Jonah was having the time of his life for a moment. Until God got a hold of it. And so he's going and he's in the boat and it starts rocking and swaying. The storm's coming. And my wife and I were talking about this last week. And, and it's just so true. Anytime you see the story where like people on a boat start freaking out. Like the apostles, the disciples, the men with Jonah. They start freaking out say we're going to die. It's going to capsize. They were probably going to die. <laughs> they were probably going to capsize because these weren't just amateurs. These were professionals. They knew what they were doing. 
They knew how to handle it. They knew how to steer it. They knew how to work it. And if these who are the pros of the pros, talking about, you know, Peter and Andrew and James and John, who are fishermen, who are out on the water every day of their life, when they cried out to Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? If Jesus didn't interfere, they were probably going to die. And the same thing with these men with Jonah. We're going to die. It wasn't a dramatic. Sorry, a dramatic call. It was a moment of truth. It was a true proclamation. We are going to die. We can't control what we're facing against. And so they pulled Jonah and they said, we pray to our God, nothing has happened. Pray to yours. And Jonah had the most real and honest response ever. He said, I don't need to pray about it. I already know that I'm the problem. What if the church did that more? I don't need to pray about it. I already know. I already know that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I already know that I'm supposed to do what God said to do. I don't need to pray about serving. God said to go. And so he called him on. He said, I don't need to pray about it. I already know. I'm off. God said something, and I didn't obey it. I'm the problem. So he said, throw me overboard. And they're like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we'll get rid of everything else first. It didn't work. And so they came back, and they're like, there's got to be something else. He said, throw me over, and God will make it stop. So they throw him overboard. The, the seas immediately stop. And what I love is the word of God, Holy Spirit, is so good that he takes a moment to define small moments, moments that could get overlooked so quickly. But it says the wind stopped, the storm stopped immediately, and the men on the boat who are previously worshiping other gods came into fear and reverence of the God of Jonah and worshiped him. God will use us even despite ourselves. And later on, we're going to mention that, but I want to challenge you. It's so much better when he uses us through us instead of despite us. And so he moves, he stops it all, and he sends a giant big fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah has a prayer for three days, crying out from the depths of Sheol, from the depths of the well, whining and moaning and groaning, till finally he gets to a point of just submission and willingness. He humbles himself and says, fine, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And God causes the fish to spit him out. Scripture says that once he is, he starts heading to Nineveh and defines Nineveh as a large city that takes three days to travel across if you're just walking nonstop for three days. It's a big city. It's a big city. And so he walks in, and what is the first thing he says? God's going to destroy you in 40 days. (laughs) What I love about this is, guys, you... (laughs) Do you understand the attitude of that? Has anybody ever obeyed God reluctantly? I've obeyed God reluctantly. Jonah was obeying God reluctantly because I know enough about God to know this. God has always called people to repent. He never once ever once mentioned repentance. You're going to be destroyed in 40 days. That's all he said. He said what he wanted them to hear. And he said, you can take it. That's the voice of God, the word of God. Take it or leave it. And what I love is that Nineveh took it. (laughs) Against all of Jonah's preconceived thoughts, against everything that he had thought, he expected. He's like, if I just tell them they're going to burn, they're going to rebel. But they received it. Scripture says that we all began to repent and turn from their ways. The king ripped open his, 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 his sackcloth and he poured ash on his head. He began to cry out in repentance. And he says he proclaimed, every man, woman, child, and beast of this earth will not eat or drink a single thing until the time is over that God may change his mind. He never once told them to repent, but the Spirit of God still drew their heart to repentance. And so we find ourselves with Jonah in Jonah chapter 3, verses 10 through Jonah 4, verse 5. And he's talking about this. And he has just called out that God's going to destroy him. And they repented. And it says, when God saw what they, Nineveh, did, how they returned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. And he did not do it. For most of us, I would hope to say that is a praise God moment. Right? Right? God said he's going to destroy him, and he didn't. Praise God, they turned back. The issue is that is not at all what happened with Jonah. And when I read this, it killed me. Because it follows up and it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. God forbid we ever come to a place 
where we are so self-righteous and so arrogant and so demeaning and hate-filled toward other people that when God shows them mercy and grace, we are displeased. He obeyed God reluctantly, and he became displeased when God showed them mercy. So this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was in my country? Isn't this what I told you would happen when you called me? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. This is why I ran away. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. What was he saying? This is why I didn't want to come because I knew you would save them. I knew that you would draw them to you. And I didn't want him to have it. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? For anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. This morning, I want to combine that with Jonah's story that God called Jonah to Nineveh that if they would just call upon the name of the Lord, they would be saved. But he asked him a question. And it's a question that I think that we should all ask ourselves frequently, if not daily. Do you do well? Do you do well? Do you do well? Because I understand one thing. Whenever I stand before Jesus Christ face to face in the judgment seat, the only thing I want to hear him say to me is, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. The problem is, if I never stop to allow the Holy Spirit to reflect into my life by saying, do I do well? I am not guiding myself into a place where he can finally answer that one day and say, well done. You have to reflect. We have to. We have to continue to be like David, as I say, on a normal basis. Search me, O Lord. Search me. Show me what it is that's misplaced, that's amiss, that's, that's gone wrong. Show me. Do I do well? Am I doing well? Am I? Is this helpful? And God challenged, do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to desire after your flesh? Do you do well to pursue your own hopes and wants? Do you do well to hold this anger and resentment? Do you do well to, to withdraw and to isolate? Do you do well to hold on to that fear? Do you do well when you speak, when you live, when you act, when you think? Do you do well? Do I do well? It's a reflection that we need to ask. Because one day when I stand before God, I don't want him to look at me and say, did it do you well? Did it do you well? Doing what you did, how you did it, did it do you well? When I know the person in front of me just said, well done, good and faithful. I don't want him to question it. I want him to take joy and pleasure in it. Do you do well? So this morning, we're going to break that down, and I want to look at three areas that we should daily be evaluating, reflecting, and checking on, and asking God, am I doing well in this area? The first one is, do you do well to preach the word of God? Are you doing well to teach his truth? Because I want to make a bold statement here. And of course, anything like this is, is in general role God uses and does miraculous things all the time. But salvation is unattainable through silence. Through silence. When the church refuses to speak the word of God and refuses to preach the word of God, then the lost world around them does not have the opportunity to hear the word of God. Like I said, God is sovereign and powerful, and he can do so much more despite us. But how much is not being done because of it? He can do it despite us, but I'd rather him do it through us. The word of God brought repentance to Nineveh. The word of God brought repentance at the day of, uh, of, of the, whole, the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Anytime the word of God spoke, lives were changed. When Jesus spoke the word of God, 
people's hearts were changed and transformed. When Paul spoke the word of God, people drew to Jesus Christ. When you speak the word of God, people begin to hear the heartbeat of a loving Savior. It changes lives. That can't happen if we're silent. It doesn't happen. In Romans 10, 14, and 15, he, the church of Rome is being corrected lovingly. And he's questioning and asking them, How then will they call on him, Jesus, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him, Jesus, of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? I love this question because what he's telling them is stop and think about it. Stop and think about it for a minute. You're asking a world that is lost and dying to live and to act and to think and to speak like Jesus. They've never even heard about him. And yet we find ourselves in the same way today doing the same thing. So many times we will overlook and whitewash the sin of the church. Oh, they've got Jesus. They've got grace. It's okay. And we'll overlook it, but then we'll look at a lost and dying world who doesn't know him. And they'll say, you should know better. You should act better and think better and speak better. And we hold a standard for the world to live like a king they never met. We know him. We should hold that standard to ourselves, but they don't. They don't know him, and Scripture clearly says they never will unless we speak it to them, unless they hear it, unless they, they, they experience through someone who's, who's bent and who has been moved. How can they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved if they've never heard of him? It's a challenging question, but it's one that we kind of sometimes overlook. It's one of those simple basics that we're like, oh, I guess it makes sense that they have to hear about Jesus to believe in Jesus. But we often take that for granted and dismiss it. He is calling a church that will do well in preaching his word. Like I said before, not just preaching his word filtered through us. We're good at that, aren't we? We're really good at creating new rules and traditions because we filtered the word of God through us. Well, this is how you have to worship because that's how I feel good when I read the word of God. Instead of it just being this unadulterated, raw, true word of God. We can't filter through us. We have to allow it to filter through the spirit of God in us and just speak it and communicate it. If he can trust us with it, we're going to see a change happening around us. We can begin to see the Nineveh of our world become to know like Christ. I can relate to Jonah in the sense of looking at Nineveh and seeing wickedness. I can understand that. It seems like anywhere we look today, we see wickedness. It seems like anywhere we look, the world is calling evil good and good evil. That they're trying to pervert the word and the way of God. I get it. I get how that's frustrating. I can look at people or people groups or communities and say, I never want to go there. Never want to do that. Don't like that. Not that I don't like them, but I don't like that. So I can get that fleshly frustration of I don't want to go there. They're wicked. They're evil. But are we doing well enough to still go and minister the word of God if he says to go? How many people are missing out on the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ alive in their lives because he said to go and speak it and we didn't? And do you do well to preach the word of God? Do you do well to, to minister it? Do you do well to allow the people around us to be saved by calling on the name of Jesus because they finally heard about him? Do you do well? The second area that we need to evaluate is do you do well to live God's nature to live his nature it's one thing to preach the word of God it's another thing to live like the Jesus we serve in Romans we, we said that it says that you have to call and to preach it to speak it but what happens if they hear the word of God but they never see that same Jesus through the people that are speaking about him. Do you remember the moment you got saved? 
not everybody remembers every detail. I know some people, they can tell you the date of the week, the day and the month, the time and location. That's amazing. I can't do that. I remember it was a Wednesday night in my living room after church. I had heard about Jesus all night long. I thought that sounded pretty awesome, and I needed that. And then I asked my mom to pray with me in the living room. That's my story. We all may not remember the certain details or moments exactly, but I know one thing. We remember the time that Jesus actually got a hold of us. Not the time we just prayed a passive prayer, but the time we really said, I get it. This is Jesus. This is the Son of God who loves me and adores me. We remember that moment. Because for the first time, you finally saw Jesus for who he was. Our goal as believers is for the world to see Jesus as he truly is through us. If we're not living his nature, they will not see him through us or in us. Not enough to just preach it. We have to do that. But we have to live that nature. You know, the nature of God, we, we understand scripture. We say it all the time. Scripture says God is love. It is the nature of God. And so many times we can wonder, what is that nature fully? What is all of God? Well, Galatians 5 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. It says it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you study that deeper, most scholars agree because of how it was written that what the Scripture really is saying is, not that the fruit of the Spirit is love, comma, joy, comma, peace, comma, but it's the fruit of the Spirit is love, semicolon. What is love? It is peace and patient. It's kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self control. It's defining what the nature of God looks like. So when we walk in the nature of God, which is love, which has been everything that's ever driven Him and ever will drive Him, we begin to walk in peace and in patience because we understand His love. His love for us, when we understand, it doesn't allow us to walk in anxiety or fear or worry because we know he's got us taken care of. We know that he's not going to leave us forsaken, that he's going to meet every need that we ever have. We can have that peace and we can be patient because we know that certainly God has been patient with me. His nature should dictate and drive and change us, should move us in how, how we're living and how we're driving. And when I looked at Jonah, what the problem is, is that I saw a man who reluctantly spoke the word of God, who reluctantly shared it, but did so without the nature of God behind it. And here's what's powerful. God still used him. He spoke the word of God reluctantly without the nature of God, and God still changed Nineveh. Like I said, we can be used by God despite ourselves. Or we can be used by God through ourselves. I'd rather him use me through me and not despite of me. We cannot be comfortable. We cannot ever get comfortable just ministering to people outside of his nature. And just being comfortable saying, hey, I'm, I'm just me. And people are still getting touched. People are still knowing Jesus. And I'm just going to be me. Don't do that. Don't do that because when you refuse to adapt to and grow into the nature of Jesus, then whenever he begins to move and to show mercy and grace and changing of lives and community in the world, you will be the same as Jonah. They're going to sit back displeased and angry. You're going to sit back displeased that other people are receiving what you received. You'll be displeased that a wicked world can still know the same God you've served. You'll be displeased that they're not receiving their due punishment and their due justice. Don't be comfortable preaching the word of God without living in his nature. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says it this way. If you're not living in the nature of God, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I've known a lot of noisy people who thought they were doing something for the kingdom. But all it did was create chaos and confusion and noise. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, look, even faith is in the equation. 
If I know that God will do it, if I know that I know that I know he's going to do it, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Why? Because it's not about simple obedience. It's about intimacy. It's about showing the world the Jesus that we came in contact with. You don't do that. You don't reflect his nature without intimacy with him. It's impossible. It's impossible. He wants you to preach the word, but he, he wants you to reflect his nature, his life. In fact, Paul goes on to the church of Ephesus and, and, and solidifies this even more in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, where he says, therefore, be imitators of God. Well, how do I do that? By walking in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So how do I imitate God? By walking in love. How do I walk in love? By giving myself up. How can I be displeased with anything if I am not a part of the equation to begin with? It's impossible. I cannot be displeased if I am not the one who is running the picture here. If I am just fully surrendered to God and is his spirit of work moving and delivering and guiding i'm not in the picture i'm not in the way i have no room to be displeased when his nature is what i am pursuing and living in are you living in his nature are you doing well to do that are you doing well doing well to show the world who jesus really is i said before i think oftentimes we are dangerously close to being if not already in the category of being Christian Pharisees to where we are worshiping an idol that we call Jesus. You know, when, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and the people of Israel were waiting and waiting and they became impatient and they called out to his brother Aaron and they said, where is he? He's probably dead now. Make us a golden idol that we can worship and make sacrifices to. So he takes all their gold and forms it into a calf. Remember the story? What did they call that thing? Yahweh. They gave it the name of God, the name above all names. And so many times, if we're not careful because we have not pursued and lived in the nature of God, so we don't understand who he is, we begin to worship a perverse image of him, and we give him the name Jesus. We have to live in his nature. We have to imitate him, stay near to him. It happens through intimacy. What I want to challenge is this, though. If the world cannot see or hear Jesus through his church, that's us, right? Our goal is to show them who Jesus really is. But if they're not seeing him or hearing him through us, that means his church isn't a part of his body. It's not a part of his body. If they can't see him, through us, they're not. We're not a part of him. If you guys know each other well enough, spouses, you you know certain things about your spouse very well or your children very well. You know birthmarks, freckles, moles, whatever it is. If if you guys knew that I have this tattoo on my arm. And then somebody shows you a picture of a right arm tattoo or a right arm and there's no tattoo. Would, you, would it be me? No, it wouldn't be who I am. And if the world isn't seeing Jesus through a part of his body, his church, then we're not his body. We're seeing something that's claiming to be his body, but we're not truly in sync with who he is. That happens by living in his nature. And the second thing, or third thing, what do we do well in? What should we reflect in? Do you do well in, in, in living in his nation? Do you do well in preaching his word? But do you do well in pursuing his presence? This has to be our utmost priority. There is nothing else in this world that we can desire or pursue more than the presence of God. Cannot be. It has to be the only thing we care about. If it is the greatest thing, 
then everything he cares about, we will naturally care about. Remember how I said that intimacy with God is what allows us to begin to look like him? Does anybody remember being so close to somebody that you suddenly started picking up their mannerisms? You ever had a close friend that would talk a certain way, that have a certain slang, a certain tick that they would do, and all of a sudden you found yourself doing it? It can be simple things like when they're thinking, all of a sudden they start biting their lip. And maybe you never bit your lip a day in your life, but all of a sudden you started picking up the mannerism of your friend. I didn't mention this earlier, but Eliana has started picking up the mannerism of Autry. So my daughter now, she'll, she'll do something, and Autry makes this cute, cute face where she does little duck face with her tongue in the lips. And she'll do it when she's being sassy, when she's thinking, when she's being playful. She's just her face. She does all the time. And Aunt Eliana's walking around the other day, and Anna's like, quit making that face. What is that face? And I looked over, I'm like, that's Autry is what that is. Because now Eliana would be like, she's picking up a mannerism of a friend, somebody that she's becoming close to, somebody that she's beginning to know deeper. It, it's natural. You don't even think about it. I realized when I was a little boy, I had watched my dad at church worshiping Jesus. And when he was worshiping Jesus, his hand would be raised like this. To you, that just may be normal. But for me, I used to worship like this. And I noticed my dad had his hand back, his thumb was pulled a little bit further back, and it was kind of to the side, and his fingers loosely wrapped. Now, without thinking about it, when I raised my hands to God, because I watched my dad and stayed in how he worshipped, I raised my hands to God like my dad did. I didn't think about it. It just was natural. It was a mannerism that I took hold of because I was close to him. I watched and I observed and began to change who I was little by little. We do that with each other. We do it with our spouses, with our families with our friends. So if the world isn't seeing Jesus in you, the hard truth is that you've probably not been in his presence. Because it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be hard to live like Jesus, to think like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to behave like Jesus if you are always around Jesus. Because it's not something you have to think about. It's something that begins to happen. Because he's not going to change into me. So the only logical response is that when I'm around him, I start changing into him. Suddenly, because I've been walking with Jesus and a fig tree doesn't give me fruit, I'm like, you're dumb. You're, never, you're not going to feed anybody ever again. Why? Because I'm around Jesus and Jesus did it. Fruitless fig tree, be gone. And I start thinking and saying and doing things that Jesus did, not because I had to start thinking about all the time, but because my best friend, who I'm around all the time, does it. Because I know him, and I've seen him, and he started to change me. He started to mold me because I like what I see, and I want to be like what I see. Are you in his presence? And there's times that God challenges me because he'll say, my son would have never done that. And I'm like, you're right, but I haven't been around him in a minute. I haven't been around him in a minute. Are you doing well to pursue God's presence? When we see Jonah, he wasn't pursuing God's presence. In fact, he wouldn't even pursue God's word at this point. He was pursuing his own desire, his own flesh, his own hatred his own unforgiveness and bitterness and malice and rage. And it cost him everything. What kills me so much about this is that, as we read, that it displeased him. He was so fueled by this that even when he obeyed God, he still wasn't pursuing God in the process. He was just obeying him so he didn't have to spend another three days in a big fish. That's all it was. And when God moved, he was displeased because of what he'd been pursuing. Did it match with what he obtained? And it kills me because when he notices, when he sees this, even still after everything, after his one-on-one -on -one conversation with God, hearing the voice of God, being in the presence of God, you understand if you hear the voice of God, he's there with you, right? If you can hear his voice, he is with you. He's not sending you pre-recorded tapes. If he's speaking, he is there. 
He's in the presence of God, hearing the voice of God. And his response isn't to respond to the presence of God. But it's so rage-fueled that it's, even though you're here with me, I would rather be dead because of what you just did. I would rather you end my life than for me to remain in your presence. Whereas Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he's looking at a group of people that just a few months before, he was attacking. He had chopped off one guy's ear because he put hands on Jesus. Then he denied Jesus to a little girl. But then he was restored by Jesus again. And he went through this process of nothing but fueled passion and zeal. And the same hothead who sliced off the ear of a soldier is now standing before a group of people. And he had every opportunity to respond like Jonah and say, you killed him, you don't deserve him. But instead... He preached a message and said, all of you who would call upon him in the name of the Lord will be saved. He didn't just say, you'll be destroyed in 40 days. He said, repent, and you can know him too. What had happened, he got to a place where he pursued the presence of Jesus over the presence from Jesus. He quit worrying about what Jesus was going to give him and all he cared about is that Jesus was with him. I've been so guilty of pursuing the things that God wants to give me over just being in his presence in my life. I've shared my testimony about when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I made that harder than it needed to be on so many levels. To some extent, it was God wanting to, me to push through and, and to, to fight through and to say, this is what I really wanted. But the reason why that had to happen was because all I cared about was that I got this thing. Everybody else got it. Everybody else was speaking in tongues. Everybody else was getting closer to God. Everybody else was doing these things. And I didn't realize it then, but now I do, is that I look like one of those sons of Skiba who would just run around trying to do things for God because of the accolades or the reputation that came with it. I was trying to receive the Holy Spirit because of the accolades or the reputation that came with knowing I got that thing. It wasn't just because I wanted more of Jesus. Not because I wanted him with me. And it wasn't until that shift happened that I received what I was pursuing. I realized that the Holy Spirit wasn't just a thing. It was the presence of God. How do you do? How well do you do in pursuing the presence of God? In 1 John 2, 5 through 6, John is writing this epistle. And he says, by this, we know that we are in him. We know that we are of him, that we are part of him. Whoever says he abides in him, whoever says that he is in the presence of God, ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. So many times we get caught up trying to make ourselves walk in that nature and we make it difficult. But like I said, when you're just in his presence, when you're just with him, you just begin to walk like him. Pursue his presence. His presence will change our nature. It'll change us. It will. We don't have to work for it when we're just surrounded by him constantly. But it's that point when we get to a place where our nature finally changes that, that God starts to take a little bit more notice and he starts to, to usher in the movement into deeper realms in our lives. And he knows what that looks like, not just because he's God, but because it's, it's pretty evident I can know what it looks like within myself or you all if we are pursuing the presence of God because of the fruit that would come with it. If I'm not bearing the fruit of the spirit of God's nature, then I have not been in his presence. It is impossible to be near him and not look like him. And what happens is the way we respond to the world around us and the way we look at things changes because like I said, we're not caring about the presence from God. All we're caring about is the presence of God. 
And we start to look like Moses in Exodus 33, 15, when he's conversing with God and he cries out to God and says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. I've said this many times, but I can't. God won't let me leave this, this truth and this illustration. We should rather be in wastelands and desert places. We should rather be in places of nothing but want and desire and need. In places of dryness where life around us is not produced. If that means that we are in the presence of God. If we are seeking paradise over God's presence, then we will always be short of God's presence. He's seeking that people who will look up and say, God, I'll, I'll give it all. I'll give away everything. I don't need a single thing in my life. I'll give it all up if it just means that you are with me. As long as it means that you'll never go somewhere that I'm not. As long as it means that you'll never send me somewhere that you're not. As long as your presence is here, I'll give up everything for it. He's looking for that kind of people who are pursuing him that deeply and that intimately and that richly and that, that purposely. Because those are the ones he can use to change the world. I don't know about you. I've been guilty sometimes to look at different ministers or ministries and say, God, how in the world are they being this influential? <laughs> you ever, ever heard somebody speak and like, how in the world do they have 100,000 followers? How are people ringing in and listening to them daily or weekly? I've, I've questioned it. I've, I'm fleshly. I've done that. I'm like, come on, God. Come on. I've said something more profound than this guy just did. And yet everybody, you're like, what in the world? Like, why is this happening? And, and I've gotten in that moment. And, and it happens when we try to, to weigh ourselves against other people. But the truth is, is that even when we look at people who seem the most unqualified, the most unlikely, the most undeserving according to skill sets or talents. We can, we can wait all day long, but the truth is, is if they are being increased to influence, there's a very good chance that it's because they stayed in the presence of God. Now, understand me too. That's not always the only reason. The enemy will raise up false teachers and false prophets, and if they're speaking anything contrary to God's word, we know it was not from God. But if they are preaching the word of God, and they are pointing to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, and they are being exalted in their ministry, I promise you it's because they spent some time in the presence of God. If you see people around you, coworkers or family members or other believers, and they seem to be getting places that you can't, maybe they spent more time in the presence of God. He's exalted them and given them influence to minister to a world because he knows now when he says go, they're not running for Tarshish. He knows that when he says go, they're not going to just say you're going to be destroyed, but they're going to say turn and repent and you will be saved. He knows when he says go, they're going to go and they're not just going to tell them about Jesus, but they're going to show them Jesus because they've been in his presence. This morning, as I was preparing, God brought me back to what I read in Romans 10, 14 and 15, but specifically that second part in verse 15 says that how can they believe if they've not heard? How can they hear if nobody preaches? How can they preach unless they've been sent? I realize that maybe sometimes we don't realize if we're sent or not. Maybe we don't realize or know if we've been sent. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand or say yes out loud, but reflect on it. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You are called and you are sent. It's that simple. That is the only prerequisite to being called and sent by the Holy Spirit is that we have received him, and now he is calling us to give him. You do well. Do you do well in preaching the word? Do you do well in living his nature? Do you do well in pursuing his presence? If not, then we need to respond to that in a moment. But if you do, what we need to ask ourselves next is, will we do well in our response? 
Because this morning, what God has put on my heart and what he is calling out to his church is the same cry that he made to Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 8. And he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us today in Baldwin City, in Kansas, in the United States and in this world? God is still crying out, who will I send? Who will go for us? Who, who will... Who will do well and respond who will preach my word and will live in my nature and pursue my presence who will I send who will go I'm praying that we all respond well like Isaiah because what Isaiah says at the second end of that verse is he says here I am here I am send me you see that exclamation point after here I am Sometimes I look at things in a picture. That's probably the theater nerd in me. <laughs> but I read that, and what God showed me was a little kid. Ooh, 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 pick me. Pick me, I'll go. Use me, choose me. If you want to do anything in this world, God, pick me. Pick me, I'll go. I'll go, send me. Are we that excited about being used for the things of God? That God's calling out, saying, who will go? That we're, I'll do it. I'll go. Use me, send me. I'll do it. Or are we sitting back? A little too traditional. A little too caught up in our own, our own nature. On our own words, our own desires. That we can't even hear the voice of God asking us because we've not been in his presence for a little while. That we're missing the call and the plea and the cry. That we're not hearing the voice say, will you go? Can I send you? Will you do it? Will you do well? See, he's given us opportunity. He's calling out to the church. I'm giving you opportunity for me to say, well done. I'm trying to set you up for me to tell you you did a good job. But you have to do it. You have to do the job. I was talking to Joe Ash a couple weeks ago, and Ann and I were sitting down with him because he is our more emotionally driven child, to say the least. And we were talking, I was like, Bob, don't you get tired that most of your attention is me getting on to you? Like, I'm trying to give you good, positive attention, and I can do that more, but I have to correct what's wrong. I have to correct it when you're misled. I want to give you better positive attention. You just have to do what I'm asking you to do. You do it, and if, if you're not responding in, 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 in the incorrect ways, and you're not living and thinking and acting and talking the wrong ways, then I have opportunity to come alongside you and to tell you you did a good job. I'm looking for it. I want to do it. When you do have those moments, I tell you, but I would like to do that more often than I'm doing now. We had to have this conversation, and he seemed like he understood it, and then 15 seconds later, <laughs> life got in the way. But today God's saying, don't you understand? I want to tell you you've done a good job. I want to tell you well done. I want to come alongside you and pat you on the back and say you did it. But we have to do it. We have to do it. We don't get participation trophies with Jesus. He doesn't work that way. He has called us to a mission and to a purpose. He's called us to preach his word in his nature through his presence. He has called us to remain there and to respond and to live from there. How well do you do with that? 